Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Strawberry. Welcome to Making It Work. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly thank our sponsors for Making It Work today. They are Cross Insurance, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, and Memic. And with that, I'd like to introduce the Vice President of External Communications at Memic, my friend Tony Payne, to say a few words. Tony. Hi, folks. Glad you could uh, tune in for this sort of tectonic shift in how we work. Uh, but what is most important to us at Memic is that you do so safely, whether you're at home or returning to the office or to your work site, whatever that may be. We have about 18,000 employers representing about 200,000 workers in the state of Maine. And our first and foremost uh, interest is making sure that everybody gets to work safely and returns home as well as they were when they arrived. We also invite you, if you're a Memic policyholder, and about two out of every three employers in Maine is a policyholder with Memic, uh, to visit our website at memic.com, where we have a lot of pandemic um, guidance available, as well as steps to take that are prudent in order to bring your workforce back to the job site safely. Excellent. Thank you, Tony. And with that, I'd like to introduce Harvard Pilgrim's Director of Sales here in Maine, Bill Barassa. Bill. Thank you, Kate. Hi, Bill Barassa from Harvard Pilgrim. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. It's a great day out there. A couple of the panelists joked that I was wearing a jacket today. So yes, it is a little hot here, but that's uh, the way it is. I want to put on a good impression. Um, on behalf of Harvard Pilgrim, happy to be uh, co-sponsoring these events uh, and happy to be contributing to our Maine natives uh, as well as the businesses across the state. Uh, after you visit mimic.com, I, I suggest you go to harvardpilgrim.org. There you can find uh, some virtual events for our uh, mindfulness programs, as well as some Zumba or some yoga classes. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bill, and thank you to Tony. And with that, I'd like to extend a, a thank you and a welcome to all our panelists for giving us their time and turn things over to the Press Herald's business editor for special projects, Carol Coltis. Carol. Thanks, Kate. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so we know that it's sunny and the temperatures are in the 80s. Uh, but we think that your time will be really well spent by joining us this afternoon because we have three terrific executives who are going to talk about the topic that is top of mind among all of the folks in Maine's business community. And that is, what are we going to do about our workplaces? What, what sort of impact are we going to see from having people for the last 10 weeks working from home? Um, as you, as you may have seen, my colleague Tux Turkle did a great job in a story that was published Sunday, sort of examining this issue. We're going to take a little deeper dive from a corporate perspective. And in, uh, Tux found that about 4% of Maine workers were working from home in 2019. Now, most folks who can work from home are working from home. And according to the Department of Labor, about 25% of Maine's workforce had been working in an office. So the possibilities of what's going to happen now as we mitigate, as we try to figure out how to navigate this pandemic uh, can have implications that are pretty far reaching. Um, so we're gonna talk about that. And we're gonna talk about with our, th with our three panelists, and before I introduce them, and just a word about format. Uh, we're going to chat for about a half an hour or so, and then we're going to open it up to questions uh, from you, from the audience. Some of you submitted questions when you registered for the event, and there's also a raise your hand function on the bottom of your Zoom navigation bar. So if you want to ask a question, uh, use that, and Strawberry, who is our master of ceremonies behind the curtain, will queue everyone up and we'll take your questions as they occur. So without any further ado, let me introduce everyone. Um, our first panelist is Melanie Tinto. She's the Chief Human Resources Officer for WEX, a global payment processing firm I'm sure you're all familiar with. Melanie has been with WEX since 2018. A UMaine grad, she held talent recruitment and management roles with Hewitt Packard, Walmart, Cigna, and Bank of America. And 
as I'm sure everyone knows, WEX built this gorgeous state-of-the-art new headquarters in downtown Portland just a couple of years ago. And the design was an open concept design based on the notion of collaboration with your coworkers. Um, it's also planning to build another office complex at the Downs in Scarborough to accommodate about 1,200 workers. So WEX is right in the sweet spot of trying to figure out what does having a remote workforce mean for us as we plan going forward? We also have with us Ed McCursey. He's president of ProSearch, a staffing and recruitment firm he founded in 1994. He also is the founder of Live and Work in Maine, which is an organization that advocates for the retention and recruitment of young people uh, to the state. And, you know, Maine is the oldest state in the country. And so getting young folks to come here and put down roots is a really big deal. Um, in his 25 plus years at ProSearch, Ed has held several leadership positions with state human resources organizations. He sits on the board of several nonprofits. And in 2012, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame of the Maine Society of Human Resource Managers. And we also have Sarah Cox, who is Vice President of HR at L.L. Bean. She joined Bean in 1986 and has taken on leadership roles in management development programs and then led a team looking at internal organizational change initiatives. Before becoming the VP of HR, Sarah formed an initiative that involved talent acquisition, leadership development, executive coaching, and secession planning. And as everyone knows, L.L. Bean is one of Maine's top employers um, and has workers in call centers, in office complexes, retail stores, and warehouses. So Sarah has a pretty broad perspective on the term workplace. So without any further ado, let me toss the first question to Melanie and Sarah. And that is, can you both please summarize how you arranged for your employees to work from home? Did, was it easy? Did most of them have the equipment or the software they needed. And from a management perspective, how are you measuring productivity and what's been the employee response? So um, Melanie, why don't you take that first, please? Sure, and I suspect Sarah and I will have some common themes as we go through this. Um, there were a few things that Wex did at the onset. One of the key, key differentiators for us was we established very quickly a pandemic response team and what that was was really a, t a small group that was charged with um, what this could potentially look like in terms of getting employees um, safely and securely uh, working from home. And it was a direct report to our CEO. And so they looked at um, several, several areas of focus in terms of how would we make sure that we had the right connectivity. We actually did a quick pilot with some of our call center groups um, to make sure that we would have the right functionality, that our systems and software were working efficiently and effectively. And so we did a couple of additions there, like things such as uh, soft phones so that they could actually do calls through their computers. We made sure that everyone had um, the appropriate equipment, which most already did, frankly, here, most people already had the laptops and such. Um, so really what we ended up doing was within a week, we had everyone from um, moving from the office to a work from home globally, and even today, we still have about 99% of our employees that are working from home um, and working quite efficiently. And you know, part of what we are trying to do is make sure that we have ongoing constant communications with our employees, making sure that they have the business updates, the tools and resources that they need to feel best supported. Um, so that's some of the ways in which we addressed getting people quickly at home. And our first and foremost goal was just to keep them safe and really partnering here in Portland with our local community leaders as well to make that happen. And, and how, has, how, has, how have you measured productivity? It's been about 10 weeks, right? So Yeah. So there's a couple different things we've done. Um, obviously, we always have goals and objectives. That's how we measure employees um, ongoing. So even before COVID, we've always had pretty clear goals and objectives. People know what they're accountable to do. Um, and so that's been, that's been important to us. The other piece that we ended up doing was making sure that we had a ways of work survey, which I know many other companies here are doing as well. Gathering the voice of the employee is really important to us. And so we wanted to make sure that we understood one, given all the circumstances that they're dealing with right now, whether it's children at home or elder care or other challenges, perhaps space constraints, 
were they effective working from home? And what we actually heard from our employees is even with the additional challenges I just mentioned, 83% of our employees still feel equally, if not more successful than they did in the office. Um, so we're finding really positive proof points. And then we asked it one step further and said, if you didn't have the additional challenges of childcare, et cetera, what could that look like for you? And employees were telling us that 89% of them would feel equally, if not more successful than working in the office um, without the COVID-19 limitations. So we're seeing very positive responses. Um, we're seeing great focus on our customers and partners with the work that our employees are doing. Uh, and um, we continue to monitor it on a frequent basis and make sure that we're meeting the needs of employees that may feel like they're less successful. Um, and that could be you know, ergonomic equipment, um, larger screens, et cetera. So we're still working with them as well. Okay, great. And how about you, Sarah? So as Melanie said, I think many of our messages will echo one another because yeah. throughout this time, which has been a wonderful Thing, we have been comparing notes across our community <laughs> and quite intentionally so to make sure that we are thinking about our community stakeholder in totality and not in silos across our industries. And that has been a powerful outcome of this particular time that I hope to carry into the future. Certainly um, continuing to focus on our, our stakeholder principle, which has been a hallmark of how we have run our business for, for decades has continued to be front and center for L.L. Bean. So thinking about the community stakeholder, the employee stakeholder, which are inextricably linked, has been critically important. Similar to um, what Melanie spoke to, we have we stood up very early our pandemic team um, and a response team, a governance structure, so that we were daily, sometimes multiple times a day, assessing new inputs, new direction, new guidance. Um, I don't think we've ever made as many decisions about our workplaces as we have in the last 10 weeks, probably not for the last five years. Um, and uh, we've had to change our mind a lot and learn a lot um, as new information was coming in. Um, a few specific things in addition to that governance and infrastructure overall, we have, uh, we quickly, as, as we um, moved to office environments at home, many of our office workers had some ability to work from home, but they didn't necessarily have a large monitor or a chair that was ergonomically correct. We are continuing to offer remote ergonomic assessments of people's workplaces at home and adjusting accordingly through our health and safety wellness team. We also have a steady stream from our internal communications team of tools and resources, things like a one pager saying, you know, tips for working from home effectively, so that we're pushing that out and singing off of a, a similar sheet of music, which is really helpful in terms of a common frame of reference. Um, I also probably cannot overstate the value of having a powerful IT um, support team who continues to innovate and optimize the use of the technology that we do have available. It's allowing us to really continue to work um, ongoing, have meetings ongoing seamlessly, which has been quite extraordinary, even to the point of having a town hall just last week with 600 leaders from across the organization wow. and a live Q&A with our executive team. So for, for us to have that kind of technological support and willingness to experiment in that way, the, the spirit of experimentation is alive and well for sure, has been really powerfully effective for us during this time. Just to speak to the question you asked Carol about productivity, what I would say is we're really just listening to our employees and our leaders in that regard right now. Is it working for you? Are you able to get your work done? Are you not able to get your work done? How can we make resources available to allow you as the, you know, we have a great, resilient, resourceful workforce, how can you solve the problems that you're facing each and every day? Um, because they're all new problems that we've never had before. And have you done any internal polling of your employees and what's been their response for having to, from having to work from home? Yes, so it's, um, we have done some, um, in fact, we just finished a return to work survey that we um, sent out across our organization. And what I would honestly say about that is that the experience is vastly varied huh. right now. So meeting, there is sort of an overarching theme of, oh my gosh, we're doing this so well. It's so effective. I've been able to stay productive and stay engaged. And there's a theme of, I really miss my colleagues, and I really miss my team, and I really miss the human contact. 
So both are true. And I think it will continue to be a challenge for all of us to meet people where they are. I know as somebody working from home myself, I have all of those feelings too. And I have that wide range of response, which is some days I think, wow, this feels normal and terrific and productive. And other days I feel like I just can't get out of my own way. So, um, and everything in between. So I think we're figuring it out as we go and trying to listen to our employees and each other well to adapt as we're able to. Great. That's, that's really interesting. I, I'd like to bring Ed into the conversation. So Ed, you have a really large client base um, and you're in touch with a lot of those executives. So what do you think? Is working from home a format that's going to stay or once the green light comes and people can return to their offices, will it go back to what we call, excuse me, normal? Yeah, I think just to echo both what Sarah and Melanie are saying about their organizations, I, I, I think the, the couple of themes are, uh, boy, this is great in the short term, or, you know, talking to clients, uh, they're proud of their teams, uh, the feedback they're getting is we can do this. Uh, I think there's a couple of, uh, couple of things in the short term. First of all, we we're all forced to do this, right? So, you know, some technology issues and then gee, you've got kids at home maybe and, you know, they're being homeschooled and they're finishing up this week. So what does summer look like? Summer camps are being canceled. So there's this kind of short term complication around all this. Uh, and I think that's, you know, to pick up on what both Sarah and Melanie said that, you know, sh short term, there, there's, there's a lot of juggling going on. It's, it's really, I, I think what I'm hearing is what they've said, which is the vast majority of, of employers that have polled their employees employees have said, you know, we, we could keep doing this. Um, and um, I, I would say, you know, that the new normal is going to be rarely is somebody going to be required to go in eight to five Monday through Friday. I just, I, I, I think it's really going to be a seismic shift here. Um, it's really going to be interesting. And, and there are obviously industries that, that um, don't apply, but I think um, most, of, most of our clients uh, were headed this way anyway. Um, you know, I, I, I think about, you know, two or three years ago when there was a really a spike on the IT front and we do a lot of work in the contract um, area. So we, we're putting people in for projects and uh, when the technology caught up enough so people could work remote, that was actually our client's preference is, you know, we don't have a seat for these people. So, you know, they'll come in for a week or two, get acclimated to the team and then, you know, they can work from home. So I, I, I think certain departments, certain industries have, have seen this coming. Um, I think the other hesitancy, there are a couple of hesitancies. One that I think we've overcome is one is the technology, right? You know, Zoom meetings, meetings like this. I think you know, everybody was afraid they were going to be the one that couldn't log on or, you know, something, you know, some technological problem. Um, and I think now that we're over that, we see how, how well this works. I know my team, uh, you know, thinks it's great. And I, and I think that um, the communication is key. And I think that we're finding that you can do that through, through Zoom. I think there's a little bit of fatigue. Uh, around that sometimes, but um, and then you know the the other the other piece of this is trying to maintain a culture. I think uh, longer term, uh, when people are working remote. Um, but uh, you know, to pick up on Sarah said, it's it's very situational. I mean, I've I've got several people that work with me that have younger families, and some of them are saying, "Listen, can we just wait until July so I can figure this out?" And I've got a couple of people are saying. I don't want to wait till July. I got to get the heck out of the house. You know, I mean, they just want to get back to the office at least part time. So uh, for my clients, you know, I think it's what, what Melanie and, and uh, Sarah are saying really just kind of resonates. So it's been roughly 10 weeks or so since everyone uh, started to work from home. And I wonder if there have been any decisions uh, within your within your corporate framework, lessons learned or commitments to, uh, you know, previously we wanted people in the office from nine to five, but now we're open to flex time once, you know, we, we can return to the office. I'm, and, and Melanie, to you specifically, um, is WEX going to continue with its plan to open its new office complex in, in Scarborough? I mean, I, I realize it's 10 weeks in, so maybe there haven't been actual formal decisions, but can you sort of give us a lay of the land that way? Yeah, it's still pretty early on. However, you know, our plan is still co to continue with the build out um, in Scarborough. So that's our intention. I think there's a few different things that really came as a benefit of having this um, experiment of everyone going to work from home so quickly. 
there was a lot of people that had different um, varying experiences or assumptions, myths, if you will, around what working from home looked like. And so those that hadn't done it before had this assumption that perhaps employees that were working at home didn't work as hard or, you know, they couldn't understand what that concept looked like. I think everyone having the opportunity to work from home together, they understand that you actually a lot of times work harder you need to make sure that you're making time for yourself and you're really focused on having some type of balance within that, um, within your lifestyle, just because your, your computer's, you know, a foot away from you. And so, you know, that's one of the things that's been um, a bit of an unintended benefit whereby people are much more open around the ways of working, um, how people work, when they work, um, and really have an appreciation of what that looks like. The other benefit of it, at least from my perspective, is getting to see employees even on a more personal level than we probably normally would have. So um, today for all of us, we don't have kids in the background, but usually there's someone popping their head in, in one of our meetings or there's a cat or a dog or a rabbit. Um, there's something on there where we're getting to see people's lives. We're getting to appreciate one another on a different level, which I think actually tightens the bond between employees and not just in one location, right? So we always had a really strong tight bond within and super tight relationships within WEX in Portland, but we have the opportunity now to affect that globally on a, on a really accelerated basis. And that's one thing I just most appreciate is it's from an inclusion standpoint, there's an opportunity for us to really bring our employees together around the world. There's an, a, an opportunity for us to appreciate the WEX that I know and love and have it really resonate whether you're in Australia or Europe and really understand what that looks like um, to sit and understand what the values and culture of WEX are. How about LL Bean, Sarah? Have there been any decisions made? So we have been um, operating under a principle throughout this time that is what, what may seem alarmist today may seem insufficient tomorrow. And that principle means that we're kind of taking every step in chapters. We just are dealing with the chapter that's right in front of us because mm -hmm. every time we try to go too far ahead, we, are, we get scared of missteps. And we really want to keep the health and wellness of our employees and our community front and center. So for us, we have been very deliberative in each step um, along the way, all the way from closing our retail stores um, on the early end of things, which was not something we did lightly on March 16th, moving people to remote working and then trying to see how long we needed to do this for. Additionally, I would be remiss not to name the fact that our factory has continued to operate, so as has our warehouse. So we have a, a large population who's continued to be on site with completely different operating practices in order to operate safely and well throughout um, that time, but that has been an ongoing part of our responsibility as well. So our, we know our first priority is to those employees in our retail stores as they open, in our warehouse and in our factory um, to continue to be on site and work safely because they have to be there to do their work. We, off the, those of us who can work remotely from offices are very much a second tier of priority and we really haven't made longer term decisions about what that may or may not look like. We know we're gonna be working from home for the summer. We, we know it may be longer but we're just taking in the chapters that are as far out as we can see so that we make informed and careful and deliberative decisions. Well, and I'd love to add on to what Sarah's saying because we've taken that uh, into consideration in terms of what, are, what do we need to do from a community standpoint? How do we best support the other businesses here? And we have the luxury given that we're in tech of perhaps being a lagger in this situation where we can keep our employees home longer, we want to make sure that those individuals that need to get back to work faster, uh, given the nature of their business, like retail, have the opportunity to do that. And so we've been partnering very uh, closely with all of the local businesses to make sure that we are connected, we understand each other's plan. And we did announce to our employees last week that we have, uh, at a minimum, we'll be staying home through sept early September at this point. And so we'll continue to keep them updated, but that's our intention again, just to give others time to open um, for those that need it more. 
And Melanie, are you doing that with all of your global offices? Yes, we are. Yep. Wow. Yeah, we have a few people that will go back early in phase one, but that will be a very limited number. And those are based on the survey that we conducted recently, which are those that really are feeling less than effective at home, whether it's through the bandwidth or, or some other challenge they may be having, we're prioritizing them. But we're really taking a one-to-one a -one, um, interview process to understand their needs and best equip them at home. And then if that doesn't work, we're finding solutions of those that need to get back in the office, which is a critical few. Great. And Ed, how about with your client base? Have, has anyone said, you know what, we've done this for 10 weeks, it, it works for us, this is what we're going to continue doing, and we're not going to lease that Class A office space uh, on the peninsula after all? Yeah, I, I, I think it's still early days for that. I mean, as Sarah said, I mean, I think people are taking this one step at a time. I think, um, you know, if I look back at when all this kind of came down, I, I remember thinking that it seemed like the government and the media was all realizing we could take this in like two week chunks. You know, they couldn't they couldn't fathom to say, well, it's gonna be September 1st before, you know, whatever is going to happen. Right. So I I think uh, most most folks are kind of taking a wait, wait and see attitude. I mean, we've got uh, over 200 employees any given week, temporary and contract employees that, that work for clients around the state, some startups, medium size, obviously, you know, larger employers as well. And, um, you know, we're, we're obviously our employers are going to take the lead from our clients. Right. Um, but, you know, I think longer term, there's, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see those decisions made. Right. I mean, I, I don't think I'd want to own a lot of commercial real estate. Um, I, I'm a little, little concerned about, you know, longer term that, you know, how, how, you know, you look at law firms and things like that. I think that um, do they really need to go back uh, full time? So, um, you know, I I think the other, as Melanie hit on earlier, I mean, a, a lot of this, there's this kind of myth that people can't work as productively remotely or even within teams as productively. And I think as we, you know, 10 weeks turns into three or four months and you start to really see the results here, um, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of employers just say, as, as, as she said, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations with employees, what's your preference? And, and I think that a lot of people, a preference is going to be at least part-time. You know, I'd like to work remotely. Mm -hmm. So let me pick up on a comment that you made earlier, Melanie. And, and that is, so I, I think everyone knows Wex has a, an international reputation and brand and has always had a collaboration as a core value and part of its culture. So how do you maintain a culture, a corporate culture, when people are all working remotely? If you, if you have any tips or any like specific things that you're doing with your workforce and Sarah and Ed, if you want to weigh in on that too, certainly corporate culture has been a really strong buzzword for the last few years. So how do you do that when everybody's working from a corner desk in their living room? Right, and it's one of the things that makes WEX great, right, is our culture. We always tout that and talk about it. Um, and Carol, to your point, relationships are really a key part of that. And so how do we make sure we're fostering those strong relationships um, and deepening them through this experience? And so, you know, I think it varies. I mean, obviously our employees would love to be in person. They know that's not possible right now. Um, I will give a shout out similar to what Sarah did to our technology team. Over the past couple of years, they've actually given us some amazing collaboration tools that we've been able to introduce. And because of that, um, we are able to stay much closer and connected than we probably would have been, whether that's through document sharing, hangouts, um, videos such as this. Um, we did, you know, we do all employee town halls around the world. So that could be, you know, 3,000, 4,000 people on a call and it's been seamless. And so that helps to continue to instill the culture, the communication and transparency about what we're doing continues to help that as well. Um, and so I think, you know, folks are clamoring to collaborate in person, but the benefit of what we're doing now is we're engaging our global employee voice even more effectively than we have been before. And so I hope that's one piece that will continue is that we've now spread the culture of WEX that is here in Portland, Maine to our other offices and really understanding the support that, that we give as a company, whether that's through our compassion fund as an example, we have a compassion fund that really helps. It's funded for, by employees for employees. And so we've been able to tap into that when people are in times of need right now. Um, we're really proud of the fact that we're able to help one another through that, through that particular fund. 
And so that just continues to give us signals and points around the culture of our organization. I think it also spreads for opportunities for employees to be able to take on different roles in the future. They may not have to necessarily relocate for that for that key role. Um, obviously, you know, time will tell in terms of what that looks like, but I think it opens new doors and it really helps them understand the breadth and depth of the, the corporate global environment um, at WEX. Oh, that's great. How about you, Sarah? L.L. Bean also has a strong corporate culture. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm just, I'm sitting here listening to everything Melanie is saying and agreeing with you vehemently, <laughs> just so you know. But um, I would build on that also just to, um, just, to, just to cite a couple of very specific things that I think Bean is doing, we're experimenting with, um, which really do all of which really reinforce our culture or even stretch it into some new directions, which is also will be interesting to see how we grow as cultures after this time period, because we won't be the same um, as whatever we were. We will, there will be at different aspects which I think will be really interesting. But a few things that I think are very helpful right now for our employees to engage in who are working at home are um, things like we are doing our health and fitness classes online. We are doing mindfulness meditation online, including at the beginning of our town hall, we did a mindfulness meditation experience to convene across 600 people, which would never have happened in person, probably at least not in that same way. So um, it was really interesting to have that shared experience. These shared experiences that are different than just our normal working meetings, I think help bring that texture and richness to the culture. Um, having walking meetings outdoors, I know Melanie, you had mentioned earlier that you were doing that. I think that's really helpful. And certainly um, as an employer who is so committed to the outdoors, making sure we're encouraging people to take their laptop or their phone outdoors and actually have meetings sitting at their picnic table or on their patio or walking um, so that they are physically experiencing the outdoors even as they're doing their work. That is certainly something that we have seen and we are encouraging over time. Finally, I would just cite that we are continuing to do all of our, uh, a whole array, not all, but a host of our leadership development programs. If you know culture is shaped so much by leaders, um, giving leaders lots of support and experiences that continue to feed them helps a lot. And so we're continuing to offer our leadership development courses virtually and online so people can convene in different configurations and in different ways to talk about the importance of their own leadership, the culture that they're setting, and new ways of operating together. There's a lot we're going to learn from this time as a community, and it will be really interesting for us all to take a look at what our culture is evolving to in another six or 12 or 18 months from now. Wow, that's terrific. Uh, I'm still trying to wrap my head around 600 people on a phone call doing a mindfulness meditation <laughs> exercise. That's really remarkable. It was, it was, a, it was amazing. <laughs> um, so let me just let me just ask for sort of a lightning round uh, question here. Um, so what has surprised you most, and what do you think remains as the biggest challenge as we as we continue with a remote work uh, situation? Just just off the top of your head, doesn't have to be a long explanation. Ed, why don't you go first? Sure. I I think uh, maybe it shouldn't have surprised me, but actually just how close our relationships were with our clients when this all hit. You know, we, again, we have two hundred employees out all over the all over the state, and so we're kind of scrambling to make sure that we're communicating with not only our our, our twelve people that are in our office, but all these folks, and we're trying to communicate information that's indirect, right? So we've got to go to our clients and say, okay, what are you what are you folks thinking? Who's communicating that to our employees? You want us to do it? So I think um, that. The ease with which that happened, it seemed overwhelming at first, but the ease with which that happened over the course of the, the first week or so, I think really surprised me. So that was, that was good. What was the other, what was the other part of it? What was the biggest challenge or what do you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think the biggest, go back a question a little bit. I think the biggest challenge is trying to maintain the culture, right? So ProSearch, we're, we're employee owned. Um, uh, I think we've always really tried to strike that, um, homework, life balance. Um, you know, I always say that we, we've got to get along because we're spending most of our waking hours with each other, but you know, the most important people are back home, right? So we've always had a lot of flexibility around remote work. So that hasn't been a big challenge. Um, but I, I would say kind of keeping morale up. And uh, I think one of the, one of the uh, 
surprisingly positive things is that we've gotten to know each other even more. I think Melanie hit on this before, but you know, when you're, when you're one on one with people and kids are going by and, and you know, you, you just, you know, I thought I knew all my employees and their families. I was kind of proud of that, but I've, I've gotten a, a deep appreciation for home life for, for all of my other 11 co-owners. Oh, that's great. And uh, Sarah, surprises and challenges, what are the top? So I'll, I'll name two delightful surprises. I think one is um, similar to what Ed said, how seamlessly we transitioned um, to using our technology to convene. Um, if you had said, I mean, if you had said to us three months ago, we're all going to be doing all of our meetings through, through MS Teams all the time, I think we would have just never believed it. And we probably would have gone kicking and screaming. I think then, you know, necessity is the mother of invention and suddenly here we are. And um, it, it, that has been a, a really beautiful and graceful transition in extraordinary ways that I, I hope stays with us. The other thing that I'm just appreciating a lot that has been a delightful surprise is the degree of um, collaboration across our state with our public and private communities, with organizations big and small, with small businesses, large businesses. I feel like we've never, I love that about Maine all the time, but I really have loved it about Maine now um, because I feel like we reach across so beautifully and supportively as a larger community and you see what a difference that makes here. So that has been fantastic. I think a challenge that we face is continuing to adhere to the real discipline that this next year will require mm -hmm. because I feel like we all kind of um, were willing to try this out and persevere for the last 10 weeks but then as we've had to let it settle into our bones that we may need to keep doing this for a quite a long time certainly longer than I think many of us had it in our awareness figuring out how to continue to support ourselves over that more extended period of time in order to create a safer community for ourselves is going to be a challenge. And we're gonna need lots of good, innovative thinking to help us do that and to do that well. That's a really good point. What happens when the novelty wears off, right? Right. Oh so, right. yeah, yeah. And Melanie, how about you? Sure. Um, I would say a couple things Sarah said. One is just how all of the local companies have leaned in and supported one another. The level of sharing that's gone across the, all of the companies has been amazing. I feel very much informed. It's funny, Sarah and I don't think I've met in person before, but we felt like we knew each other even before this call because of all the different calls and connect points we've had over the last uh, few months. And so, you know, I think those friendships and relationships with our colleagues will continue post COVID. Um, and I very much appreciate the fact that we're really thinking about what's going to best serve our community and provide the safety um, that's going to make our state successful. So that's that's really important. And it's one thing that I think we really um, never could have anticipated to the extent that people are leaning into that. The, the piece I would say from an employee perspective is just the level of creativity that employees have shown. They've risen to the occasion, whether it's through you know, creating their own ideas around, um, to Sarah's point, virtual workouts, coffee chats, virtual happy hours. They're finding ways to connect and have fun while working. And that's really important to keep that culture and to keep, um, keep people motivated and frankly, give people a social connect point that they desperately need. And so it's a benefit right now. I think to Sarah's point, it will be a challenge over time. People are craving the need to get together, the need to connect on a more, uh, a more personal basis. And so it's something we have to watch out for from a wellness perspective. We just need to make sure that our employees feel supported, that they are connecting periodically, and that we're giving them what they need to work, live, and thrive. Um, that will be a key challenge over the next couple of months. Great. These are, these are all terrific observations. Thank you. Uh, and it looks like we've got quite a few questions in the queue. So, Strawberry, do you want to tee up the first question? Sure. So the first one we have in here is, uh, what will companies do with the big buildings if more people decide to work from home? So I guess, I guess I'll start because we have some of the newer, bigger, <laughs> bigger buildings, although LLV does as well. Um, so there's a few things that we're doing. You know, when we did survey our employees, our employees did say when they return, it won't look the same. So 92% of our employees want a flexible work environment 
And for, for each employee, that may look different. It may be, you know, four days in the office, one day off, or periodically when needed, they're working from home. And so I think we'll still have people in the office. Individuals want to collaborate in person. They like that social atmosphere and environment um, that Ed referenced before. They like that connectedness. I think our space internally within the building may look slightly different. So it may take on a different structure depending on people's needs, whether they want hoteling space. I actually think um, not only will they want hoteling, but they may want more private space. They're used to now having quiet time to think and work. They like the structured focus. Uh, that's one benefit that working from home brings to many of our employees. And so they may ask for more uh, drop in areas that are quiet space. And so I think the structure itself will exist, the way in which it's configured within it may look slightly different and we'll continue likely to have a lot more drop-in collaborative spaces as well where people can convene together. I'm happy, I'm, I'm happy to talk a little, just to build on that, um, that answer, I would say all I know is that it will look different and it will feel different and um, people's requirements are going to be different as well. So. I don't know, except that I don't think we're heading towards a future where we have no building um, or, you know, I, I think similar to you, but I do think the requirements are, are going to be very different and it's part of what we're engaging our workforce in shaping right now to talk about what do you imagine that you might need and um, how would we use a conference room differently or in new ways and what are the, the rules that we would need to set up for this next year, but then beyond that. so. We're learning about that right alongside everyone else. I'm just curious, since both both Sarah and Melanie, you spoke about uh, there being a lot of collaboration among the companies here in the state, small and large. Have any of those conversations veered into maybe we can collaborate on sharing space, on sharing office space? I mean, I'm, I'm just curious if there, it, when you talk about It'll be different when you come back to the office. Is there a possibility that there will be a broader collaboration than just beyond your own corporate structure? So we haven't had that conversation specifically yet. It's really been around what is, it's kind of a day by day. What do we need to Sarah's point? Uh, what are you doing? How are you best serving your, your employees? I suspect as we get a lot of that detail back from an employee perspective and start to share that across, um, we'll look at what the common threads are and themes. Um, and, you know, time will tell. We just don't know yet what that will look like in terms of sharing space, but it's, you know, I don't think anything's off the table right now. It's just going to take time to really um, determine what's going to what's gonna best meet the needs of each of the companies. Yeah. Carol, I, I, I'd actually, I, I think what you'll see is um, more collaboration amongst this, the smaller companies, the startup community and mid-sized companies. I think you'll see a lot more co-working space open up and, and that kind of thing because, you know, to, to the point about hoteling and things like that, you know, you can you, you can imagine a company of 20 employees just working remotely but having a need to, to collaborate once a week or once a month or, you know, whatever, right? So I, I think you'll, you'll see a lot of that. I think you'll see a, a good deal of kind of this co-working space. Good, okay. Um, next question, Strawberry. How do you think the tendency towards remote work will impact attracting people to Maine as a place to live and work? Oh, that's right in Ed's wheelhouse. You want me to take that one, the infomercial? Sure. Um, <laughs> no, actually, I think, uh, to be honest, we, we've actually had this conversation as a team. I, I'm on the board now, but uh, Nate Wiles and uh, Katie Shorey, who, who run the work in Maine, one of the conversations we've had is, this is no time to be out there saying, gee, we're trying to recruit people here, right, when there's a lot of workers who are feeling you know, either underemployed or maybe gonna be unemployed. Um, but one of the things we think is that you can really market this idea that if you can work remotely, you know, if, if you just got told by your Boston based or New York or Washington DC based employer, you can work remotely full time, why, would, why wouldn't you come to Maine? You know, why, why wouldn't this become your home office, right? So um, I think that we're actually gonna shift the messaging there a bit. So I, I think that, I think it's great for me and I, and I think so instead of trying to recruit people up here that maybe are competing with somebody that's already here, what we're really gonna do is have them import their job, right? And they're gonna buy a house or they're gonna rent an apartment or whatever, and they're gonna you know, contribute to the economy. So I, I, I think it's great for me. Great. There have been some recent articles too, Carol, around that in terms of er folks in urban areas wanting to potentially move to more rural areas. So I think Maine will be a very attractive spot for people yeah. outside of the state or returnees to the state. I think you're right. 
Um, Strawberry, next question. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sarah mentioned Microsoft Teams. What other software or technological tools should applicants learn for working virtually? Ah, we're, what are your top favorites, folks, when it comes to technology to allow you to communicate and connect with your workforce? We're big fans of Zoom at the Press Herald. I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're, we are using Microsoft Teams and it's working really well. We also have used Zoom for many conferences as, as many of us have. Um, and I would also say that there's an extraordinary openness right now to use whatever works. So there's a, there's a whole element of, um, I think, openness to new technologies that we'll probably all be talking about and using for years to come. Yeah, I yeah, agree. We're, we're uh, I was just going to say, I agree, you know, the G Suite is what we have, which is all of the Gmail and chat functionality collaboration tools. The reality is in the last week, I've used uh, Microsoft, Zoom, and G Suite for our meetings. So we're, we're pretty agnostic at this point in terms of what the technology is. The functionality has been great on all. And, you know, even in some of the trainings that I've been in, we're doing breakout sessions, breakout rooms, et cetera, right in the virtual setting. And we aren't missing a beat. It's just like being in person. So it's, it's been really helpful. Yeah, we're, we're trying to be agnostic. And I, and I would say not, not only for, you know, people to, to have once they, they join an employer, but we're, we're still up and running and we're doing a lot of virtual interviews. We've got, we've got employers that are still hiring, uh, especially on the technology side. And they're hiring, I don't want to say sight unseen because they're seeing people via video, right? But they're, they're hiring people without having met them face to face uh, in person. So um, that when, when you talk about a skill to learn, I think, you know, the new normal is going to be employers and, and, and job seekers are going to have to feel more comfortable with this, uh, at least for the first couple of rounds of interviews. Yeah, yeah. I would also, I would just, I would just also build, because I think I'd be remiss from my IT folks if I didn't say, the one big thing is to make sure that organizations are thinking about their IT security at this particular time. And obviously, we're seeing a lot of coverage in that regard. So, uh, you know, working closely with IT teams to make sure that you're doing it in a safe environment, in a protected environment, secure environment is obviously critical. I feel like we're talking about that more than we ever have before, and it seems really pertinent. Yeah. And I would just let folks know, if you haven't been checking the chat function on your navigation screen, a lot of people are suggesting social media platforms and other software that they've had great success with. So folks ought to pay attention to that, check that out, see if it will work for your organization. Another question, Strawberry? Uh, actually, I saw this one in the chat. I think it would be pretty relevant. Um, is this helping your, uh, excuse me, is this helping find your next company leaders? How are their responses, attitudes, and accomplishments help talent rise to the top? I'm happy to speak to that because it's a conversation that we're really actively having right now as an organization. It's as if we um, reshaped our, the governance structure, the roles, um, and all aspects of our organization overnight almost. And what we're noticing just as we look across is seeing new, new people rise to the challenge in new and different ways. So to the extent that it does allow us to see people and talent and ways of operating that we might not have seen before, I do think it allows us to think forward about how to leverage those talents in the future. And um, I've been doing a lot of reading, I'm sure you have too, of how this is going to reform our organizations in some ways. It will reshape them. It will, it will provide new roles that we didn't imagine we had previously or new processes that we need to attend to. So I think there will be opportunity out of this in terms of the talent landscape and the leadership landscape it's a little, I'm a little fuzzier in terms of exactly what that will look like, but you can definitely see it coming. Are, are you seeing that come from any particular generation, Sarah, or is it across the board? That's a good question. I, I think my own actual experience is that it's across the board and it's, it's all, it's multiple levels and functions and roles and individuals. Um, it's just that our context is so different that the well-worn paths of our structure of the past are not always working now. So we're needing to just pioneer some new pathways and that's creating opportunity and interesting dynamics that we hadn't seen before in some very interesting ways. Oh, cool. Uh, another question, Strawberry? 
Uh, can the panelists discuss what interpersonal skills or soft skills mean when human contact is remote? Can those skills be learned? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. For as long as I've been a journalist in Maine, and particularly as a business journalist, business in Maine is conducted face to face with a handshake. It's very, I don't know, it's, it's very much an eyeball to eyeball kind of uh, relationship. So doing this remotely, I think that's, a, I think that's an interesting question. Any, any thoughts on that? I think we're all getting more comfortable with with video, right? So I, I, I think it's the distinction between phone and video like this, we are face to face. And, and I think you can pick up on gestures and you can pick up on on um, on all that. So I, I think this is the new normal, to be honest with you. I mean, one of, one of the things we haven't talked about, it's a little off topic is, you know, I don't, when you think in terms of uh, account executives, business development people, they used to travel to clients, you know, to kind of show how important they were, right? And I, and I think that this whole idea of Zoom and all, you, you can have these conversations um, and, you know, deep conversations about, uh, you know, about business uh, without having to travel and spend, spend overnight away from your family or whatever. So I, I think, you know, just getting comfortable with this new format is really the, the most important thing. Do you, do you do testing? I mean, have you guys had any opportunities to do a sort of a, let's do a dry run. I want to see if you are framing yourself properly in a video chat, if you are, um, you know, what your background should be. I mean, I, I, I see Twitter and I always am scared. Somebody's going to submit me to Room Raider and I'm going to flunk. So I, I'm just curious, are, are, you, are there specific advice or are there training techniques you're offering folks to get comfortable with this video world? So we did several things right at, from the beginning of some of our folks that were already um, almost 100% work from home. We had them share their best practices, tips and tricks on how to be most successful. And so that really helped in terms of um, helping people understand what it looks like day in the life, how they actually structure and are most effective. Um, I think the biggest part of this, and we've all experienced it, is just the um, the exhaustion that may come from being on video all the time. And so we're trying to start to say, how do you how do you start to balance that? Have some in person, have some on the phone. Um, I think people are are surprised that they are able to keep close connection while they're in this video environment. Um, so it's been a great a great experiment from that regard, and people have learned those new skills. There's also, um, just at this time, I think a natural level of empathy and trust that's being built um, because we're all in this together. And so the, the video environment has been, people have been very accepting of it, of course. I think people like it. Um, I feel like I mentioned before the inclusion from a global perspective, it's such a better experience for employees around the world. And so I agree with you, I grew up in Maine, right? Everything is close and face-to-face. Um, and, and so how do we make sure that that continues? I think, you know, we've all been saying, how do we best support our local businesses? How do we make sure we're leaning in to support one another? That's just what we do right now. It just happens to be virtual. And so that's going to continue to be just part of our DNA of Maine. I don't think that will ever go away. It's just who we are and in, in how we conduct business. Um, it just looks slightly different right now. I also would say it's really important right now to keep lowering the bar around perfection um, for people so that they don't feel so much pressure around that. And I know I'm constantly saying, um, you know, every day my goal is not to exceed four small mistakes or two really big mistakes um, because I feel like we really need to allow it to be okay if a child runs into the video or a pet sits on somebody's lap or, you know, suddenly a car alarm goes off. Um, that is our world now. So somehow inviting the wholeness of that experience into this space together and making it okay, I think is a really important best practice for all of us to keep living with indefinitely. So. You know, it, it occurs to me too, Carol, it, 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 it's kind of interesting. On the one hand, I feel like we're, we're going to a place where it's less formal because of a lot of what Sarah just said. On the other hand, you know, we've got this formality of sitting in front of here, or how's the lighting and all that. But I just think once we get more comfortable with it, I, I just think it's going to be a less, a less formal uh, atmosphere around employment and, and hiring, you know, and again, allowing people, you know, technology is going to, going to mess up every so often and the lighting's going to mess up and you're going to get forgiven for it. Right. 
Well, this is up. Oh, it looks like we have one more question. So this will have to be our last question. We're, we're, we've gone a little bit over, but I'd really like to get as many questions answered as we can. So Strawberry, can you tee up the last question, please? All right, the last one is, how will the transition to this new Zoom environment impact travel, on-site meetings, conferences, trade shows, et cetera? Yeah, there's yeah. a whole industry based on that, right? So yeah. what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we've, um, we place a lot of uh, business development folks and, I, and and I've got a lot of friends that are in, in that uh, area and they've been saying from day one, you know, I mentioned it before, but it's really interesting. They look at me and say, let's see, I used to fly to Kansas City overnight for two hour meetings, stay overnight, take everybody to dinner, get back, you know, get on, get back on the plane. They'll think of that expense for the business, but also just the wear and tear on that person, right? And in this new normal, it goes a little bit to what we were just talking about. I actually think you're going to be forgiven a little bit, you know, by that prospect or that client who's going to say, gee, you didn't come all the way out and buy me dinner. I mean, they're getting all those hours back too, you know? So this idea that, you know, you can't do this over two hours and, and, and jump off and, you know, stay in your home office. Um, you know, I, I, I think that that this is a bit of the new normal. So I, I think uh, you're going to see a lot more Zoom calls and, and, and again, people just more comfortable with that being, acceptable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Ed. I think some of it's the capacity and efficiency, as well as the acceptance of it. We quickly pivoted with our customer and partner meetings to have those as virtual events. We've also taken in all of our uh, learning and leadership development virtual at this point in time. And so it's been working very effectively. I think ongoing, that will be part of our part of our core curriculum and how we conduct business in the future. And to Ed's point, you know, you used to go to a three, four hour meeting, maybe a half a day meeting, and you lose potentially two days. And so not only is there the cost, but there's also the, the efficiency of time. And that's going to play, um, play big time, I think, in the future in terms of how people think about where they go, how they participate, and the fact that they're still actively present, they just may not be in person. Yeah, and I would just add, I think it just will increase the intention with which people really focus on why they need to go when they do. It's yeah, not that right. they won't, because right. there's some really important moments when we need to be with each other. And um, I think that people will just think that through more carefully um, now and in the future. Well, this has been a terrific conversation. Thank you all for joining, um, for joining us here. If we were doing this in our regular business breakfast form format, you would be deafened by the thunderous applause coming at you. Uh, so please just imagine and embrace that. Um, and for you folks out there in the audience, thank you for joining us. Thank you to our sponsors. Um, we will be having another Making It Work uh, webinar on uh, June 10th at, at one o'clock. We're going to be looking at onboarding and training. How do you do that remotely? So, uh, so please join us for that. And thank you again to our panelists and to everyone for, for tuning in this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.